There's been a lot of bipartisan talk recently about mass incarceration, with a few new laws aimed at addressing the problem, like the Criminal Justice Reform Act passed here in Massachusetts last year and the First Step Act signed by President Trump in December. But advocates say there's still a long way to go, especially when it comes to keeping people who've served time from reoffending and ending up back behind bars. So a group of local lawmakers have proposed some changes they hope will make a big difference in recidivism. One bill would loosen restrictions on who and when friends and family can visit someone in prison. Another two would make phone calls cheaper or free for all inmates in state prisons and jails. Ahead of a hearing on the issue tomorrow, I'm joined by Liz Matos. She's the executive director of Prisoners Legal Services, which is supporting these bills. Liz, it's good to see you again. Me too. Ayanna Alberg is the co-founder of a local group for women affected by incarceration. It's called Sisters Unchained. Her father was incarcerated for much of her childhood. Ayanna, it's great to meet you. Thanks for being here, too. So let's take both these issues separately. Start with visitation. The rules in county and state prisons, from what I understand, were changed last year. Yes, more restrictive. Uh, in the state. So the, the state. The, the regulations apply to the Department of Corrections. Okay, how were they made more restrictive? So before you could walk in, you would fill out a form, give them an ID. No prior uh, notice. No, no prior notice, okay. no caps necessary. They would do a background check, and then if you were approved, you'd go in and visit the person you were there to see. Now there are caps on the number of people you can have on your list of visitors, um, you meaning an incarcerated mm -hmm. person. And there are a number of other restrictions on uh, who you can have on who you, who can visit you. If there are two people at different, if there are people at different prisons that um, say a mother wants to visit um, her child and her nephew, and they're at different facilities, she can't do that because they're she not. She can't both. be on both people's no. lists, even if they're relatives. Right. And what's the rationale on the part of the administration for doing this? You have to be. It has to be immediate family members, uh, and the rationale. So I'll say. The stated rationale for the changes was to lower contraband that's coming into Is there facilities. any merit to that? We would say no. We're also litigating a case on this. But uh, no, there's been no indication that any of the changes have resulted in a reduction in contraband. Overdoses are still really high inside prisons. And uh, it's also a little bit, it stretches the imagination to think that the amount of the contraband that's inside prisons is coming in from individual visitors. Mm -hmm. So, I Ayana, your father was in prison, I believe, from the time you were seven, is that right? Um, well, actually, um, when I was born, he was incarcerated. Okay. Um, and he was in and out, spent a lot of time. And then um, he had a big sentence of 10 years, like the mandatory minimum. From when but, you were seven, right? Yep, yep. And all how, together, 17 years. How much were you able to visit him? Um, so I was visiting him since like I was born. I don't. My earliest memories are actually like when he was shipped out of state, but he was incarcerated at Walpole, and so my mother would bring me up there. Um, she was 18, um, a young mother, and she would just bring me up to visit my dad. What did that mean to you and your mother to be able to see your father? Um, well, I just want to emphasize that families are like the real sense of like support, the only real sense of support that people have when they're inside. It's not the prisons that are rehabilitating our family members, it's really us. So that lifeline through visitation and through phone calls is deeply, deeply important. And also a lot of people who are inside prison who are parents are still parenting behind the wall. So even though the first time I laid eyes on my dad, he was in a, you know, um, incarcerated, um, we still built that relationship, and he played a really um, big role in my life. So. What did it mean to him? I mean, it's hard for you, I know, to speak mm -hmm. for him. It's easier, yeah. obviously, to speak for yourself. But what did your father tell you and your mother that those visits meant? Um, well, he, did, he never said it per se, but, mm -hmm. I mean, when he walked in, like, that big smile on his face um, just meant a lot to us. Um, and in addition, every time I would talk with him on the phone, we would always go back and forth in terms of like just his goals and his latest dreams. And I really played a big role in terms of like helping him do research. And we really like, we were a team, you know what I mean? So I do know yeah. what you mean. So can we talk about those phone calls for a second? We've discussed this with Andrew Cabral, the former sheriff of Suffolk yeah. County on the radio. The cost of phone calls, I, I guess they're not so horrible in state prisons. Am I right about that? And it's in the county prisons where they're out of control? It's it's out of control everywhere, honestly, it but it's the cost is lower in the state prison system. But still, you know, Ayana is one example, but many people are paying over $2 for a 15-minute call. And if you're talking to your loved one every day, it easily amounts to $20, $30 a week just to maintain basic contact, right? If the counties are higher, they range anywhere from almost $2 for a 15-minute call in the state 
um, correctional um, system to 750 if you're in 750 for, for a 15, 15 minute, minute phone call yeah. and there are, there are bills that as I said would make the calls cheaper or free and for those at home who are saying well free is ridiculous my understanding is New York City and San Francisco that's right. already have free phone calls what's the rationale for for that why should essentially yeah. we pay for it we the taxpayer would end up paying for that right and families who are taxpayers are paying for it twice, right? Because their taxes are paying for correctional services, and then they're basically being taxed a second time for the cost of what should be a But I'm going to pay, service. too. Why should I pay? I mean, I assume the vast majority of people there probably don't have somebody in their family who's currently incarcerated, and their question might be, even if they're compassionate souls, why should I pay for this? Why should they pay for this? Well, I think one huge reason, although there are many, is that it lowers recidivism, and it there are studies upon studies, including the Department of Corrections' own studies, showing that it increases the, the um, chances of success on reentry. For many of the reasons Ayana was just saying, it maintains that contact. But also, this really hurts children and families, right? They also need to feel connected to their parent or their loved one um, behind the walls. It, wh wh how, how did you afford this kind of thing when you're... Well, so we did it. So I was going to add, in addition, like, my mother definitely struggled to keep her phone on. And so that was hard in terms of, like, an extra financial burden to keep her phone on and also pay to receive calls from my father. And I also work at an organization called Families for Justice as Healing, and we provide a program called the Participatory Defense. And essentially what it is is it um, offers, like, we offer support for people who are being prosecuted or family members who are supporting mm -hmm. their incarcerated loved ones. And a lot of times, moms come in and they, you know, they're venting about, you know, just having to make the impossible decision between like choosing to put money on their son's canteen or choosing to put money on like uh, for the phone. So, you know, can you we just end for the minute? Is there hard evidence that that contact, whether it's visits or regular phone calls? does reduce recidivism because mm -hmm. it seems to me that's a pretty great motivator for a taxpayer to support yeah. there is hard data many, on that. there are many studies absolutely going back 50 years um, and the department of correction again did their own study on this so they recognized the correlation between increasing contact and lowering recidivism rates so and the other thing i would just say is that um, the benefits that we will gain from eliminating the cost of calls are far greater than any cost to society. We're all bearing the cost of, of public safety and corrections, and this is one area where the the cost is pretty marginal compared to what we have to gain from And by the way, the visitor in the club might not just be a kid or a mother. It may be somebody helping that person with a future job possibility. Absolutely. We so know before the changes, there were church groups that would go in and visit with five, ten people, and now they're limited to one. Got it. Well, I hope you get the changes. We've got to go, Anna, unfortunately. Congratulations <laughs> on your you. work. I wish you luck with it in the future. Thank Liz you Singh, so much.